r slash ask credit people who work for airlines what are secrets passengers don't know employees and their families get id tickets id years for industry discount which means they only pay taxes and fees and nothing for the actual ticket the airlines basically lets them fly for free and not just with their own airline but with every airline in any alliance the tickets are standby tickets so you're not guaranteed to get on board but you get a seat more often than not the family members can travel on these tickets without the employee my dad worked for an airline in star alliance so i used to get free tickets with airlines in one world and sky team as well as star alliance i usually traveled in business class all around the world a return trip between europe and japan was something like 200 us dollars in business class and maybe 50 us dollars in economy i don't get any perks anymore as it was only valid until i turned 25 i enjoyed this perk until i turned 25 2 in germany for trains yeah well i mean trains are expensive in germany <laughs> paramedic here if you switch on your alarm lights on the ambulance while being on the inner field of the airport because well you just get there sometimes they will totally shut down all incoming and outgoing flights until they know exactly what's going on my buddy learned this the hard way needless to say people got mad at him needless to say people got mad at him nothing says you ducked up like being the subject of an faa incident report at least he didn't get the I have a phone number for you to call after you are on the ground. You know how all the other armrests can be raised except for the one next to the aisle? Turns out that one can be raised as well via a small button and a divot on the underside of the armrest. Useful if you want to spread out a bit more. Though some flight attendants may tell you to put it back in place. That's a good way to get a sore elbow slash knee. It's also a good way to get out of your o quicker. Every second matters. Two pilots are served different meals and cannot share. This is done in case of food poisoning. And only one can be a Christian. In case of rapture. Edit. No I'm not serious thanks for the gold though. I heard a girl say this sentence while at a college bible study group. Did you know American Airlines won't let two Christian pilots fly on the same flight? In case of rapture. I stopped going after that. And one must be asleep. In case of Langliers. That there's a huge list of things that can be missing from the aircraft while still being allowed to fly. True. It's called a minimum equipment list, Mel. Counterintuitively, it's a list of what can be broken on the aircraft while it still remains airworthy. It should be noted that the operational limits of the aircraft are altered to respond to broken parts. For instance, if certain lights are broken, the aircraft is restricted to daytime use. Usually there's two. Mel is as you said. Minimum equipment list. That's produced by the airline and mentions things such as passenger entertainment. Some lighting. Galley equipment ECT. These are also tailored depending on the aircraft's operation. For instance. An Arctic Circle airliner won't want to fly with some of its heating and cold weather breaking slash de-icing not working. Whereas a flight in California can function fine with faulty on-ground de-icing equipment. The MMEL or Master Minimum Equipment List is produced by the manufacturers of the aircraft. It contains the list of sort of minimum minimum equipment list. The coffee is absolutely disgusting because the no one washes the container that goes out every morning. The station agents who get paid way too little don't give a hit about cleaning it. I certainly didn't when I worked for AA. Also, because we weren't given the proper supplies to clean it, we pretty much just rinsed it out and dumped coffee into it. Be nice to the ticket agent and they will pretty much always let you get away with overweight bags. If you were funny, I'd even not charge you for bags. Standard airline coffee is absolutely awful. True. But during my last flight with Ryanair, they had a new coffee where the ground coffee was in a cup with a filter and they poured hot water in the cup. Freshly brewed coffee on board the plane. Amazing. Edit. To add to this. I googled because I forgot the brand. Freshly brewed Lavazza coffee. This is a good idea because not only would it taste better, it would likely save them money over the long run since they wouldn't have to throw away millions of half-drank pots of coffee a year. Nice try. Alkida. 
I thought it was ISIS now. Terrorist groups are just fads nowadays I remember the good old days of the IRA. Worked at multiple airports is a consultant and this is common at almost all I've worked at. Mechanics love to take their coffee breaks right behind the security checkpoint. This is where you will see women in a rush with their outermost garments off and bending over to put their shoes back on. The jackpots are passengers that didn't know a sweater or hoodie they are wearing had to come off until they are told to remove it by that sap, so they have very little underneath. I wasn't part of this so don't downvote me. Just telling the tales of the trade. Not an airport. I worked at a theme park in Florida. There was a water ride where ladies would often get their blouses splashed with water. There was a bridge over a part of the ride where you could look straight down as the riders went by. It was a very popular place for male employees to stop and look over the rail of the bridge for a few minutes. My partner worked for Delta for about 4 years as one of the guys who loads and unloads your luggage and waves once. Nothing is safe in those bags. They pop open all the time and your hip just gets haphazardly shoved back in. They get tossed around like volleyballs. It's sad as a lie. A lot of decisions about boarding or switching flights. ECT. Are at employee's discretion. I have like 150 legs in the past 10 years or so and never had anything broken in my luggage. Buy good bags and don't pack like an idiot and you'll be fine. Are you a centipede? Almost every commercial flight you ride on has a dead body on board. Possibly two if you're on a wide body, large, aircraft. Former cargo agent. Can confirm. If you ever see a large white box being loaded onto the plane. Boom. That's a dead guy. What color boxes do they use for women? Flight attendants have a list of who is who and what seat they are in. As well as what level of frequent flyer they happen to be. Or if they are employees or family and friends tickets. This is why you will see them being rude to someone or bending over backwards for jerks. Flights are routinely overbooked because there's a estimate brute of what percentage of people tend to miss the flight. So if you don't have a seat assignment, you might not get on. Which is why they ask for volunteers. If you are a frequent flyer and know the busy times and flights you could volunteer all day from every flight going to a hub and make $1. 000 in credit. Invest in quality luggage. You are the only one that handles your bag with care. Your bag is going to take a beating in the system. Edit. Wow this got a lot of attention. Yes I know Southwest Fars don't have a list of who is sitting where. Obviously. I have to say to any Redditors out there. If you get a chance to work for an airline. Take it. It was a great experience in my early 20s. Even while going to college on my days off. I was also able to fly around the world for free. I can't recommend it enough. Sure there are plenty of bad experiences like getting yelled at all day long by irrational and irate passengers whose flight you just cancelled after you had them wait for hours. Or dumping the lav on a windy day. Or knowing you're walking into a very bad day of work just because the weather is bad in your city or wherever your flights are coming from. They pay isn't great, but if you enjoy traveling, work for an airline. I'm an outstation mechanic for multiple airlines. I cover all flights at a major US city airport by myself. Where to start? If your flight has a maintenance delay and there is no on station mechanics for that carrier I get called. If it's a quick fix, I fix it. If not we check to see if it can be deferred to get fixed later. Either way, most of your delay is spent waiting on me to do all the paperwork to clear the aircraft or for me to finish the other 7 calls I'm out on to get to your plane. There is also constant pressure on both me and the pilots to clear slash fly aircraft that have some fairly significant problems. I have airlines try to get me to sell some pretty sketchy stuff to the pilots to get them to fly and avoid a costly delay. I have no problems telling a pilot to call his controller slash dispatchers and tell them to duck off if I'm not comfortable with whatever concoction of deferral action I was asked to perform. Don't get me wrong. The airlines would never willingly fly an unsafe aircraft. But if there is say an engine vibration that is just right at a runt hair under the limit they will fly it. If the oil is super low but servicing it will cause a delay service it at the next stop. If the pilot encounters something at altitude that I can't duplicate on the ground sign it off and see if it happens again. 
those are the ones I usually push back on depending what it is. Also, if you have to get out of your seat so a mechanic can fix something don't itch about it. I get harassed all the time by passengers, even though my sole purpose is to get them in the air. Besides, I tell gate agents all the time not to load packs until I get out there, but they never listen so go itch at them. This is turning into a soapbox, so I will stop. I flew United from Ord to Richmond. That. A while back. I forget whether it was a 737 or an A320. Plane is very delayed. Maintenance issue. But finally takes off. We don't get all the way through ascent. And the pilot does a hairpin turn, and we are going back to Ord. No explanation from the cockpit or crew. Pretty much all the people on the plane thought we were going to die. Get on the ground and they finally explain that the maintenance issue was loss of cabin pressure. They were going to try and fix it again. And see if we could finish the flight. Even though it would be super late. I think the flight crew was based out of Richmond. And wanted to go home. Passengers were given the option of taking a different flight the next day. And about two thirds did that. I was not one. I stayed and flew to Rick. Turns out. They couldn't get the cabin pressure situation sorted out. So they decided that what they would do is fly aboard Rick in a commercial airliner at 7,000 feet. The specter of 9 over 11 was still fresh in everyone's minds. And I cannot imagine what people on the ground thought when they saw a goddamn day 320 flying over their house at 7,000 feet. I had a winter coat and one of the postage stamp sized blankets from the plane. But I was still cold the whole way there. Flying an entire flight at 7. 0, 0, 0 is my dream as a passenger. Sometimes your pilot can be on food stamps because they only make 19k slash year. Baggage handlers see hundreds of bags a day. No bag is treated special. Unless it is obvious. Even then. Depending on the person. Sometimes they are not, which is rare. Bags are not intentionally harmed. They are. However. Intentionally thrown. Slit. Jostled. Stacked under hundreds of pounds of other bags. And exposed to the element, because that is the nature of the job. You can safely assume that your bag is touched and handled by at least 7, 8 people. The flight segment. If you are connecting. At least 10 different people. Not including tsap. Sometimes. The vehicle that fills the potable water for washing hands and making coffee is parked next to the vehicle that is used to dump the hitters and fill the blue juice for the laps. They are not supposed to. Sometimes. They are parked at a distance from each other. Which is policy. Yet the guy who is filling the water is using gloves that he hasn't changed in over two years. The most power you could probably wield is Twitter. The employee in front of you has so little power to actually remedy tough situations. Baggage handlers are usually short-staffed. As well. Customer service agents are usually limited in their options. Also. It would help us get a message to higher ups. Because our work is not being supported as it should be. Hell. I'd even recommend asking an employee about the problem. And say something like. If I were to take my complaint to Twitter. How could I phrase it in a way that would help you too? You get more customer protections buying directly from the airline. All those third party travel sites are owned by the same company. And you lose a lot of the rights afforded to you in the airline's contract of carriage. If you're nice to people, they'll be nice back to you. My uncle is in the hospital dying right now. And my cousin had to fly here to Houston from Arizona yesterday. She was scheduled to come in at 9.30pm, and he might not have made it that long. She called the airline told them she needed to see her dad. And they got her on the next flight out, so she could see her dad for a few hours. Heh. I once had a cancelled flight, and I knew our next flight was booked out the as with like 2, 4 seats left. So. The flight that was cancelled, had a line the gate couldn't handle. They sent them down to the counter where I was working. I had spoken to one of the women on that flight, and she told me she was flying out, to see her mother was was dying. I saw her in the back of the line and I knew she wasn't going to make it, if I got to all these people first. I waved her to the front, and gave her a seat on the next flight out. This dude who was platinum, top flight status at AA, got so ducking mad. He started huffing and puffing and yelling from the line, that I'll let her skip. I told her to ignore him. 
gave her her ticket, and told her to go to the gate, since the flight was due in any minute. He gets out of line and starts screaming at me. I explained the situation, and he felt like the biggest ass. He even apologized for yelling. But when I told him no flights were available until the next day he started up again. One of the memorable moments I had working there. People fake needing a wheelchair to gain boarding priority. 10 wheelchairs get on and only one person needs it getting off. We call them miracle flights. I worked with cruises for a while and apparently there's this constant problem with elderly people feigning feebleness to get the prized wheelchair cabins. Which have more space and a bigger shower. They'll borrow walkers and wheelchairs from friends in attempts to pull off the ruse. The cruise lines that cater to majority old people get really cutthroat about it to a funny degree. You'll find these big warnings when buying a handicap accessible cabin that state that occasional use mobility devices don't count and you need to present medical forms as well. On top of this, there's a disclaimer that if you buy the handicap cabin, that it can be switched to a person with real need immediately once you get on board and then they can stick you in the hittiest cabin left. I read up stories on it, and apparently non-handicapped people do get booted. Even if they are 80. And they get super pissed about it. This is great. My dad recently became wheelchair bound, and it's amazing how many people try to abuse disabled amenities. Last week we tried to go to the movies, but the whole row of wheelchair seats were booked. Mum and I ended up going anyway and none of the people in those seats had wheelchairs next to them. Ducking like and subscribe.